NBA, NBA Central with two L's got pro again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <that's> the- <laughs> hey, they got me about eight times this year. The last one, an alien took over Doc Rivers' body. That's the last one I fell for. Welcome to Rogue Bogues Basketball Series. Another few weeks to wrap up. A lot. This might be a longer show, so we apologize in advance. A lot going on. We've got, uh, obviously, the planes, NBA playoffs, a lot of news in the NBL world with free agency opening up yesterday at time of recording. Uh, we'll go through all the all the uh, the matchups that we can right now. Obviously, we don't know a few of them, but a lot going on pro in the, in the basketball world. Obviously, the WNBA draft was on today. Shockingly, Caitlin Clark went number one. That, that blew my mind. But uh, that that's gone down. There's there's even some free agency news or, or extensions at least in the NBA as well. So a lot a lot in the basketball world pro this time of year. Yeah, it's definitely a wacky time of year with extensions late and playoffs playing, and you know, and then. You've got some other news. I, I don't even know if we've discussed it yet with Detroit um, is looking for a new general manager or head of basketball. It's a lot of weird stuff that happens the last week of the season. You get total, I mean, no namers that are playing half these minutes in the last game or two. It's a... Uh, it's an interesting deal, man, but yeah, I'm sure we'll cover some of it. It's a great time, actually, now that you mentioned it. If you're a club that's got to you know, fire your GM or coach, it's a good time to do it because there's so much news going on leading into the playoffs. Mm-hmm. It can kind of just escape by. Like in, in Australia, we have this thing where politicians – will release like some sort of bad news like 5 p.m. on a Friday <laughs> just because just yeah. like, it's a news get, dump they call it or yeah, something. Yeah, it doesn't get the dump. traction, right, rather than a Monday. It's the same as this in the NBA. But, if you're going to you're gonna fire someone or not extend someone or, you know, basically fuck someone over, you do it Do it at this time of the year in the NBA, leading into the planes and playoffs and all that stuff going it's, on. Um, there was 97 stories about uh, Bronny James going to the draft. <laughs> there was like a little inkling that, oh, by the way, Detroit, uh, Detroit let their general manager go or, or they're going to look for a new one. I don't know if they're going to reassign him or whatever. And then also the OKC coach gets coach of the year, like just sliding that in. But there's 170 friggin' no offense, but like 170 message, uh, Stories on the Bronny James going to the draft deal. I thought that was interesting. Is OKC one confirmed? Is it? Yeah, confirmed it today. Oh it yeah, just I missed that. that this um, well, we we both picked that one. So great job. That's a that's obviously. I think it was by the coaches association, like uh, you know the MBPA. Oh, so it wasn't the official. Oh, so not it's, yet. Not yet. No, nah, it's not trend, the official uh, coaches of the year award, but the coaches all voted. NBA, NBA Central with two L's got pro again. <laughs> oh, <that's, laughs> <laughs> hey, they got me about eight times this year. Uh, you know. The last one, the aliens took over. Uh, aliens took over Doc Rivers' body. That's the last one I <laughs> fell for. But uh, all right, you know, we're not going to do team so. of the weeks because we're going into the playoffs and planes. So we're going to go through these pro. Uh, mm-hmm. We'll start in the West. The planes are set. We've got Kings versus Warriors and Pelicans versus Lakers. Who you got in these two pro? Folks, all since our world is upside down, you would probably say, well, Golden State because of experience. I'm going to still go with Golden State with experience, but that means Sacramento is going to win by 20. But um, I, I say Golden State. I just, I just think they – that playoff stuff, it, it, as you know, man, I mean, when you're used to it, I know they're not playing great, but when you're together, you know, you've sort of been through it. I, You know, Sacramento's up and down. I think – I think Golden State will will take will take the play in this in this series. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. Look, I think the I think it's going to be closer than we both think, just because the Warriors are very good at adjusting mid series. This is a one game encounter, right? So mm. yeah, um, I think the Monk out hurts Sacramento heavily. Um, we've mm-hmm. seen how they've played without him and haven't been great over the last course of the month. They they were they were close to five six a month ago, roughly. Uh, maybe mm-hmm. a bit more than that. I could be wrong. Maybe six weeks, but th- they've been in a free fall since then. Um, so I-, I think Golden State get this as well. Um, I think they're playing. They've played some good basketball over the last course of this, you know, f- last four to six weeks. Golden State have up and down, but they've played a little bit better. They were they were down to eleven at one point in the season um, out of the playing. So they've they've bounced back. I-, I can't see them losing this with the experience that they have. Um, which has them then go through to play the the loser of the Pelicans and Lakers, which I think – look, I think Pelicans were solid throughout, um, but I just think the Lakers, you know, will just – will just can you know, they'll get that push. Um, we'll get to some some Lakers stats later on in the show in, in useful or useless, but I think they'll just – you know, they've been there before. They've been in these battles. I think New Orleans 
should be, you know, better than they are, maybe. Um, I thought they, they they were probably unlucky to miss out on a guaranteed playoff spot. They kind of fell off the last the last week or two, which cost them. But yeah, I, I think I think the Lakers, um, even though it's not on their home floor, I think they'll <clears throat> they'll steal that one and then um that then goes on to Golden State and potentially Pelicans in my book. Who you got out of Lakers and Pelicans? Yeah, you know, Bogues, the Zion Williamson how bad was the injury with the wrist? Have you heard anything? Trent, have you heard anything with that when he fell on his wrist? Is he out or is he questionable or is he totally healthy? I have a look now for you, bro. Okay. I, I, I don't know how serious that was. And then Ingram, I know Ingram screwed, cost me my, uh, cost me my fantasy basketball season because he was hurt the last like 10 games or so, but I don't know how healthy he is going into it. I, you know, even though the Lakers people give him a hard time about how, you know, how poor they play at some points, they, they, I think they are together. They're they're pretty healthy. I think they're good enough to to beat them, uh, to beat New Orleans. But it, it'll be a tough one. I, I think I love the way New Orleans plays. You know, besides McCollum and Zion, you know, uh, you know, George, um, you know, Herbert Jones. I'm a big fan of. You know, like the other guys, Valanciunas. The way they play, they move, they move the ball pretty well. They play hard. Um, it, it'll be an interesting. I think it'll be an interesting close game. But I think. Especially the league doesn't want to see New Orleans over. You know they want to see LeBron go as you know as long as he can. I think I think they're good enough to push through at least a playing game, a playing series. Yeah, I agree. Trent you got in. Yeah, Zion left the second quarter, came back in the third, scored thirty-one okay. points in thirty-one minutes. Yeah, so he's good. He's fine. And Ingram, I guess Ingram's NBA out, right? Central with three L's got me again. I don't think Ingram will be. Yeah, Ingram's unless out. Unless they make a late push. But I don't think it. Yeah, be Ingram's fine. out. Yeah, look, I, I agree with you, Pro. I think I think the the Lakers will get a nice little push. Um, the whole LeBron story, I think the Lakers are needed in the playoffs. As much as people hate that conspiracy theory, I think it's it's pretty close to factual. Any 50-50 any call will be 90-10 towards the Lakers. You know, so no doubt about uh, it. So that goes. And then and then um so that leaves us with New Orleans and Golden State, which I think I'm going Golden State. I think I think the two big markets, LA and Golden State, are getting out of the planes. Um I just think it it'll sell better, it'll be better better viewing. I think TV viewing will be better. And I'll tell you what, I think either whoever gets that, you know, uh, probably not Sacramento, but if, if the Warriors and Lakers do get through, I think, okay, so he could fall. <laughs> I'm calling it now, bro. I, I think, you know, I, I think it's going to be a tougher first round series than, than people think with that one versus eight or nine. I, I don't want to, if I'm okay, see, I don't want to see the Lakers or the Warriors. I'm hoping I get Sacramento or, or New Orleans if possible. Um, just because. They're young and unproven, and they're, they're playing battle-tested veterans, so they're going to have to work for it. Um, and I, I would not be surprised seeing that series go six or seven, if not um, OKC okay, falling out, bro. It's an unbelievable phenomenon with them being first. And, and just sort of how young they are in, in experience. And, you know, some people expected them to jump up a little bit, but not this. And you know, a lot of people will say that they're not big and strong enough. They don't have the size. With You know, they don't they don't trust Chet. You know his body holding up against a big body. I don't know if that would be a big problem early on, but um, inexperience is big in the playoffs, and I, I think that people don't understand it. it is a different energy when you're, you know, when when you go from the regular season of the playoffs. It doesn't matter how good you play in the during the regular season. That is a uh, a monumental task, and and from I would say ninety percent of these guys, if not more, this is their first really taste of the playoffs, and. Um, It'll be an interesting series. Yeah, you don't want to see the Lakers because of the experience thing. And the Lakers aren't bad. They're not a terrible team. Now, would you expect them to beat a number one seed? Well, it depends on the number one. If this was like Golden State from a couple of years ago, no. If this was, you know, a healthy, you know, a healthier Phoenix group that played together all, you know, for more than a year, maybe. But yeah, it, it would be an interesting, an interesting first uh, first round series for them. Yeah, and SGA is obviously back to form from his injury um, earlier on in the month, so it's good to see him him playing. He was in, in and out of the lineup with a quad injury, so he's he's all good. But yeah, I mean, it's it's going to be interesting to see how that all works out. But yeah, I've got the Lakers and um, and Golden State, which might be controversial to some, but I, I do like New Orleans. But I, I don't know, I just think that big market push will get him over the line. Uh, let's go to the East with the other plane, <clears throat> Bulls Hawks at nine ten, seventy six is Heat um, at the seven eight. Bulls Hawks. I mean, with Trey Young, Trey Young still out, correct? Like he's he's done for the season. So, um, 
yeah, I, I think I, th- I just don't think the Hawks have enough scoring to try and get. I, I expected a whole lot more out of Atlanta. They they were they were really surprisingly bad this season. I thought you know Quinn would have done a much better job at least getting their defense better. It wasn't um, you know he had a similar similar trajectory in Utah with Rudy. He had that same piece kind of in Atlanta with Capella. I thought it was a good fit. He's, he's, he had those systems before. Donovan Mitchell, Trey Young, all that kind of comparing all that. They just couldn't get done. They were they were just horrifically inconsistent throughout the season. But I'll, I'll go Chicago on that one just based on form. Chicago kind of closed out the season rather consistently compared to Atlanta. Um, and then the other one, the 76ers and Heat is a hard one, is a tough one. Um, and Bede's obviously, I wouldn't say limped in, but I, I wouldn't say he's at 100% peak physical condition and he's going to have to play a lot of minutes to get them through. But it's hard to count against Spo in these situations. You know, he does such a good job on preparing his team. It is a one-game series. Um, it is in Philly, which makes it a bit harder. But I'm going to go with Miami in this one. Um, and then beyond these two, the Philly-Chicago, I think Philly will get the eight seed is my prediction, Pro. Yeah, I'm going to go... I'm gonna go opposite of that with Philly. I mean, it's gonna be it's gonna be a hard nosed game for sure. Um, I'm gonna go with the home team. Just I don't know, just playing the numbers. I guess usually a home team, you know, playoff situation, one game deal. I'll go with I'll go with Philly at that, and then the Chicago Atlanta. Look, Atlanta's been a dumpster fire. So is Chicago most of the year until the last month or so. They've finally sort of. You know, they finally leveled off. You know, Kobe Weiss played well. You know, obviously DeRozan, Vooch, all those guys play well. Even Andre Drummond when he was you know asked to do so. They played hard. They played together um, a lot better than they did early in the year. So I would say, yeah, Atlanta's, yeah, been they've been a, a real mess most of the year. So I would say Chicago and then Philly beats Chicago and then Miami. Um, Wait a minute. No, I'm sorry. Miami beats Chicago for the and eight. then Philly gets in. Yep. So okay. that's what I think. That'll be, yeah. Uh, the 76ers heat game is the one I want to watch. Out of all the playing games, that's kind of the one. Mm-hmm. Um, Kings Warriors as well. But yeah, 76ers heat will be a good one. All right, so that moves us into the playoffs. Um, let's go through each series, the ones that we can. Obviously, the Nuggets, we don't know who they're playing yet, so we're not going to touch that. OKC, we don't know who they're playing at. Boston, I'm calling now, will win their first round game series <laughs> no matter who comes through, I, I think. Um, the Mi- Miami one might be a bit tricky, but I'm, I'm going, I'm going, still going to go Boston. It will be a tough series, whether it's it's Philly or or Miami, bar our picks. Uh, and Knicks, we don't really know right now. But let's go with Clippers and Mavs. Just to hear your thoughts on uh, where that one goes. This is probably a pretty close series for the most part, um, you know, in the, in the West and your 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 four or five teaser um is always always a coin flip who you have. I'll tell you what, Bogues. Dallas Dallas could beat anybody in the West. Anybody. The two teams that I think that they match up the least against is the Clippers and Denver. And I think those are the only two teams that in my opinion they could beat Dallas. Dallas has been a juggernaut. I, I saw a stat the other day. They're like 18 and one when Gafford starts. You know, since that trade deadline deal, getting rid of Williams and bringing in Gafford and bringing in PJ Washington, they've been re- they've been one of the hottest teams in the league. Um, you know, they don't have the the ball obviously stops with Luca and, and Kyrie to a point, but that ball, especially with upgraded five with Gafford lob threat, more a little more experienced and lively. But you know, it's good to have lively off the bench, but. Man, I'll tell you what, they've been great. Now, the Clippers, I just think the Clippers, the home court, you know, that's where the home court really gets you. I mean, you know, obviously all their their main players are all healthy. They're I think they're deeper than Dallas. Um, their benches I, I considerably better than Dallas. I think that's where they'll wear them down, you know, with you know, G, you know, with George Kawhi and Harden. Obviously, that that's a tough matchup as it is. But like the other players are like Terrence Mann, Zubach, Norman Powell, you know, Westbrook, Westbrook, you know, Plumley even, um, you know, coming off the bench. So Daniel Thice, like they, they do have, they do have a good second unit that I think Dallas is going to have a hard time with. I think, you know, they'll build leads with Luca and Kyrie, but then, you know, those guys are going to have to sit at some point or play a ridiculous amount of minutes. But I do think that 
They could steal a game in LA. There, there could be some of that, but I, I feel as though if Dallas got any other team, they could have made, make a run in the Western Conference Finals. I do think the Clippers, the way they've, they, they played for the most part in the last couple of months, plus all their guys are healthy. I, I think it's good. And they're going to have home court advantage. I think it's going to be a tough one. I think I, I, I expect. Uh, the Clippers in six. What do you think? Yeah, I'm going Clippers in seven. I like Bar Harden. Both, you look at George and Kawhi, they're both two way players that can guard the Mavs, mm-hmm. the Mavs star players, not great defensively, right? Mm-hmm. Elite offensively, Luke, Luke is, you know, pretty poor defensively. Kyrie, yep. Kyrie is okay. He's got good hands, but he's not going to try to make a huge effort to stay in front of you or be physical. But then mm-hmm. you look at their end. Yes, they they got Harden, who's who's pretty poor, but he's got good hands. But he's a pretty poor defender. But then you got your other two stars on the ball guard, Westbrook guards. You know they got guys that can get up and in that are physical. That you know, and that's why I think the series is going to be one. I, I I think they're going to put Luka Doncic in every single pick and roll they can, and every single action they can, and try to take his legs right. at that end, knowing that he's not great defensively. He's going to have to step that end of the floor up for them to have a chance. And then still try to save his legs for the offensive end. It's going to be a bad mix. So that's why I think I think it's good. It's got all the makings of a seven game series, in my opinion, because I, I, I think that you know uh, the Mavs can have a poor night, and then all of a sudden Kyrie goes for twenty in the fourth quarter, or Luca has a night. Yeah. So that's why I think that. But I think barring any health issues for either team over the course of the series, I think the Clippers' death. I love Powell off the bench for the Clippers. He's had a fantastic year. For, you know, he should probably win that sixth man of the year, in my opinion. Um, he's been great for them all year. I think Monk, Monk was up there as well before the injury, but I, I like I love Powell for, for what he's done for that team. So mm-hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna go I'm gonna go the Clippers in seven and home court obviously makes a huge difference as well. Um, next one, uh, Minnesota and Phoenix Pro. Uh, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this one because this this is this is a tough one for Minnesota. I mean, Phoenix haven't played. They're just so inconsistent. You just don't know. You don't know which Phoenix is going to show up, and that's that's been kind of like the KD teams of the last couple of seasons, right? They've got so much talent, and they can just they can beat, you know, they can beat Goliath on any given night, but they can also get smacked by David, right? Like it's 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 one of those things where you just don't know which Phoenix is going to show up. But if I'm mini, I don't I don't love this matchup. I mean, the West we've spoken about this even leading into the playoffs that. You're gonna have playing teams in the West that are <laughs> that could make a run to a conference finals, and you're gonna have guys mm-hmm. that are you know even like you said Dallas at a five, Phoenix at a six. Like it's a tough matchup, but I, I love you know Minnesota's had a great season. There's rumors that Towns might be limping back. Um, I'm not I'm not sure where that's at, but there's maybe later on in the series or second round. You never know where that is. Pro that could be fluffed and run out by the teams to try and mess with the other team's scouts and whatnot. But there were there were rumblings around that. Um, I'm just not sold on Minnesota Pro. I just can't. I, as much as I'm, you know, talking about Phoenix's inconsistency, they got three kind of elite players. I don't think Bills played that well this year, though. Um, but Booker and Durant, two elite scorers that can just win you a game off their own bat. A good, um, I think Grayson Allen's been really, really good for them. Um, shooting the three ball, you know, tries to guard at the other end. So I'm going to go with Phoenix in this one. I'm going to go with Phoenix in six. And and go with the six C pro. Well, this this is a tough one. You know, I thought I thought the Clipper, then uh, Dallas series is going to be a tough one to figure out. This is really tough because I don't trust either team. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, I, I would it's say, like you know, I would say Minnesota probably has played as a unit better. You know, they've had some injury hardship with with Towns for sure. Nas Reed has stepped up, and that's another guy that should be in the six-man conversation. I don't think he should win it, but I think he should be right there. But those guys play together. They, you know, they they guard people. They play, they play together. They move the ball. Um, I don't know if they shoot it well enough, especially if you're not going to have Towns. You know, obviously Edwards is a shooting threat. Conley depends on the day. Um, Nas Reed has been pretty good, but. Do they have enough shooting? Do they have enough offense, in my opinion, to beat Phoenix? I don't know. Um, I'm just going to go with home court advantage. I'm going to go with Minnesota in seven, but I think it's going to be a slugfest. Um, it'll be an interesting deal. One team that could really score and doesn't really guard, in my opinion, in Phoenix. And 
now you got Minnesota who's who grinds you out, has has the superstar in Anthony Edwards. You know, the question is who's the better player? Like usually we want to bet on the team the 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 team with the best player in the series. Edwards and Durant was going to be a big time matchup in my opinion. And and they got obviously who's going to shut down Booker as well. That's you know, when you have three guys that you have to really look out to shut down, two really, Beal sort of does his own thing, but you know, with Durant and Booker, you got to really concentrate on. It's going to be a tough matchup too. But I would say just the home court advantage will probably play a play a big uh, a big factor in this. And then I just like the defensive minded team, you know. And plus, they don't have a ton of experience though in the playoffs. So I don't know. I- I'm just going to go with the home team, play the numbers on that one, in seven. And, and go with Minnesota in seven. I think this has the remnants of that Clippers of that. Uh, a Clippers Utah series with Gobert, um, mm. where they because you look at you look at Phoenix's roster. I mean, Nurkic has been okay. He's been up and down. He's had some good games, some bad games. Mm-hmm. Uh, Phoenix going to go small in this series at times. I would not be surprised yeah. if we see KD at the five at times, um, and they just roll the dice that way. And you look at um, the only other backup really at the center spot. Oh, Anderson. Yeah, and and, and uh, Eubanks, right? Um, so for, oh, for them, yeah, for, okay. for Phoenix. Yeah. So it's like you, you're not playing him big minutes. I think you could even see Bol Bol at the five, um, a little bit maybe, and Katie at the four, just get some length out there. And you know, I think they're going to play some junky lineups, and that's what I would do against Minnesota, just to try and get. You know, they're so good defensively because Gobert is back there protecting everything. Let's see how good your perimeter defenders are without him back there trying to block everything. And I think it's it's got the remnants of that series where maybe they try to they're going to really put the pressure on 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 the coaching of Minnesota. To say you still want to play Rudy forty minutes, 35, 40 minutes. Cool, we're going to go some small ball lineups and absolutely pick and roll the shit out of you and have him close out corner threes and whatnot. And then it's a tough spot for Minnesota. You play that chess game of like shit. Rudy's strength's now taken away. He's out of the paint defensively. He's not really bringing a whole lot offensively. Let's get him out of there. That's a win uh, for Phoenix, I think. Yeah, so then you'd probably have to go, what, Kyle Anderson, Garden Durant, if you're going to go small. Nas Reed probably, probably no, not they, the guy they, you they want to do Nas that. Reed because at least he brings you yeah. something offensively. But, yeah, it's like what, yeah. what, what do you do? What, what, what's the move? Do yeah. you, Minnesota's That's been – That's the problem. Minnesota's success this whole season ha- has been Rudy at the five for 38 minutes a night or 35 minutes a night. Yeah. And even when teams went small, they were like – they went, teams went small and even went the hacker shake, they were like, nah. This is our shit. This is why we're successful. But in a playoff series, you know, you and I have been in these playoff series as you're, you're staring down the barrel 2-1. you got to make some decisions, right? Like so, and that's, I just yeah. see a little bit of the fingerprints that whether they do that in Phoenix or not, who knows? But you can, you, you can, you can do that sometimes with Katie at the five because he's so long. Look, if, yeah. if, 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 if they want to come back and, Post up Rudy with KD guarding him. That's a win too for Phoenix, right? Like it's like, yeah, okay, cool. You want to post your five, you know, your non skilled five man at the offensive end against KD. It, we'll take that bet. And the free throw shooting down the stretch, you know, Rudy's at sixty three percent, sixty four percent. That's going to be tough. Like I think you got to pick your poison. Do you go with your offense? If Rudy can't be that guy, and you got to go smaller, do you go Nas Reed who gives you more offense and not enough, de- not not great defensively? Or do you go Kyle Anderson or Alexander Walker, more defense, less offense? That'll be that'll be an interesting deal. But yeah, I mean, you do lose your sort of elite. You, you lose what makes your team a little bit special, having a rim protector like Rudy, um, you know, isolated that he can't really play as many minutes. And that's been his deal the last five or six years in the playoffs, like elite player in the regular season. I mean, still elite in the playoffs in certain, de- de- you know, certain regards. But when teams go force them to go smaller, or he can't make free throws or score, that's a problem too. So, you know, when you isolate him where he can't like can't score on rolls, he can't score on lobs, you know, and then you force him to get to the free throw line late in games, that's going to be a problem. So, yeah, it is going to be a chess match for sure. And you know, coaching staff in Minnesota is going to work. You know have to earn every quarter they get. So yeah. you might be right, but Phoenix has been so inconsistent. So I don't I know. I think their man. defense will step up. I think I think those guys that just cruise through the regular season, I think they're, they're – look, they're not going to be elite defensively, but I think in a playoff series with scouting and, and, and a lot of dissecting of film and tendencies and this, that, I think they'll get to a competent level defensively. Um, they're not going to be elite, and I think that'll be enough to get them to win the series. Um, Denver, we don't know, of course. OKC, we don't know. I'll put a tweet out. 
once we know those series, because our podcast won't be for another couple of weeks to, to evaluate that series, we'll put a tweet out with my mine and pro picks. Uh, let's go to the Eastern Conference. Obviously, Celtics, we don't know. The Knicks, we don't know. Cavs, Magic, Pro. Um, Oof. The Magic, yeah. <laughs> yeah the, but the, look, the Magic have, 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 have somehow, I don't know if it was because everyone fell over at the, uh, the finish line, but they surged out of that plane. Um, they were four uh, towards the end of the se- season, and they, they they lost a couple of games late. Uh, finished finished five and five. If they just went, you know, seven and three in those games, they would have got the four seed in home court. But the the Cavs get home court back in that series. Um, who do you have in this one, Bogues? This is going to be a ugly series. <laughs> I, I, I'm just, you know, Cleveland's not playing well. Um, there was talk about them firing their coach early in the season. I mean, just so bullshit. I mean, I thought I thought Bickerstaff's done a good job there for sure. You know they've had they've had some injury issues they've had to deal with or, you know throughout the year, and some some other things. But man, I don't know, folks. This is going to be a seven game deal. Um, maybe you go. Maybe I go Cleveland in seven, but it's going to be a tough one. Orlando's good. I don't I don't trust their guards enough. You know, the, obviously with Boncaro and you know and I don't know, man. Like you got. Who do you like, Bogues? I'm gonna go. I'm gonna. I'm I gonna have, have no to think idea. about this one while you talk. I have no idea. Yeah. And and Donovan Mitchell's kind of limping into the playoffs, right? Um, yeah. You know he hasn't. He had he had a bone bruise, where he missed a fair bit of time. Um, yeah, this is a hard one to pick. I, I think it's going to be ugly. I'm with you. I still like Orlando's scoring and playmaking. You look at them and you're like, how they? How do they? How are they even in five seed? In my opinion. Um, yeah. I mean, everything seems clunky for them to get wins, but they, but you know, Mosley's done a fantastic job coaching them oh, and getting them. Fantastic. Yeah, so you kind of don't want to doubt them, but I think Cleveland just have they have length and size. They have some, you know, they have some some playmakers there that can get it done. Obviously, Donovan Mitchell and, and Garland and or Garland is Garland is he out? Garland, yep, he's out or he's in. Is Garland up? Is he? No, he's he's all right, isn't he? He was he was hurt towards the end, wasn't he? Um, I think um, it, I, as far as I'm aware, he's been playing. He's been playing. Okay, so we're good. Um, right now, he's a game time decision. So um, is he? Uh, he was a game time decision for his last game. I think he'll be fine. Okay, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's just up to one week with a right shoulder sprain. Team announced they're doing an MRI to confirm. But I, okay, so he'll, I, he'll be I fine. I think the shooting. I think the perimeter play in the shooting goes into Cleveland's favor. The home court advantage goes Cleveland. Experience goes to Cleveland. Um, I would say Cleveland in six or seven. I think Orlando's not going to be an easy out. I think those guys play really well together. You know, Mosley's done, like we said, he's done a, a fantastic job. I love Carter, Boncaro. I'm not in, in love with, like, Suggs and Fultz. Um, Anthony's okay. I really like Anthony Black, but, you know, this is going to be his first playoff, so it'll be interesting. Um, Jonathan Isaac has done great defensively in the last month or so. Um you know, it's been great to see him, you know, semi, you know, for the most part, healthy most mm-hmm. of the year. So I would say, I would say Cleveland in seven of this one. Cleveland in seven. Yeah. I'm going to go, I'm going to go Cleveland in six. So we are, we're pretty similar. I just think, yeah, home court. I think the Cavs have, have had, have been battle tested a little bit over the last couple of seasons and they got the length and size to, to, to try and push through. Um, Bucks paces. The big question, Giannis, he, not a lot coming out. They're keeping very mum, but it looks like, you know, talking about a calf tweak, um, it doesn't look good. I, I just don't think you, you recover. A guy that's, especially when you've got a super athletic guy that moves the way he does, coast to coast, Euro step, you don't want a proppy calf. Um, you know, it can lead to Achilles. It can lead to different issues. you got to be very, very careful. So he he could miss at least the first couple of games, if not series. The paces. I believe swept the Bucks. I'm pretty sure mm-hmm. during, they the, own dur- the Bucks. during the regular season, right? Um, they had the whole ball shenanigans game where they got in the fight about about the ball. Um, this one, if you you know, the Milwaukee's been horrible under under, uh, under Doc. Let's not let's not question that. You know, we can talk about that later. Um, well, let's talk about it now. But, but I mean, Doc Rivers, you know, Bucks are not a serious professional team on the road. Was his quote. And then he gave a similar quote to what Giannis gave. Like, I look at everyone from the equipment manager to our medical staff. We're just not, a, you know, not a serious professional team. They're fourteen and fourteen under Doc. 
clunky, doesn't look just doesn't look good. Um, and then you're missing your 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 your, en- your little engine is missing from from the team. Look, Portis has been fantastic, uh, I think, for them uh, in the games where he's had to start with Giannis out. He's done a fantastic job, and he's another guy that you know we should probably mention for Sixth Man of the Year. He's had a fantastic season again, but um, he can probably buy you a game or two. But if it's the course of a series, um, I, I think Indiana maybe steal it with Giannis out. It's not a hard one to call, but look, the Pacers haven't finished the season well neither. They, they, you know, Halliburton. We, we, we talked about him numerous times uh, before the new year about how well he was playing, and then we talked about him late in the season with post injury. His numbers are basically. He's, half of what it, what he was pre-injury, right? Um so I don't know. I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with Indiana just based on the Giannis injury and all the shit around Doc and playoff series and I'm gonna buy into all the hype around that. Uh they swept in the regular season, which I, I I don't buy too much into that generally, but with Giannis out, you know, Milwaukee could be staring down to you know, to zero oh and two going to Indiana, right? And even if Giannis does come back, it's a deep hole to get out of. So I'm going to go Indiana four two. I'm going. This is a complete wipeout. I'm going to go with Indiana in five. Oh, wow. I don't care if Giannis plays. Yeah, I don't care if Giannis plays or not. With Giannis, I mean, I think a, a perfectly wipeout. healthy Giannis, you'd still be four one. They own these guys, and the, and look, yeah, but there's all the, the thing for, with the owning Halliburton stuff, bro. Like in the regular sh- season, when you get swept, it, it does matter a little bit. But sometimes it's you might have rested a guy, you're on a back to back. Like you know what I mean? It's a little, true, true. I haven't, I haven't really investigated that all that much. But I just know the high octane offense. This team hasn't played great all year. They played; they were okay in the beginning. Don't get me wrong. When you know when they had Adrian Griffin coaching and all that stuff, but like it's just there's been something about this team. They're older, you know. They're clunky offensively. Their their bench has been just okay. That not, not, nothing great off the bench. You know, Chris Middleton has been a shell of himself. You know, Lopez has been Lopez has been okay. But like the Dame Lillard thing, Dame's really hasn't played great. I don't know, man. I, I just don't. I don't see it. The way Indiana, the way Indiana's just sort of the offensive part. Halliburton, that's a tough injury to to deal with. You know the, you know what he had to deal with, and I think that, you know, he's got time to rest. He hasn't played great, but that offense has still been pretty good. They haven't finished great. But I do think that this series, there's something about it, Bose. I just think it's going to be 4-1, 4-2. I'll go with 4-1. I think Carlisle is going to have those guys ready to go. Um, we both know how good he is with, you know, getting teams ready as far as, you know, X's and O's and scouting and, and just doing his homework on it. Um, it ends his streak of first round exits yeah. <laughs> since 2011, too. So it's been pretty bad. I yeah. think it's ready to, to move on from that. But, um, I just I don't I, I haven't liked even when they were doing well early in the year I didn't like the way it looked I just you know I, I this team is something about it I just don't I don't know if it's the bench I don't know if it's the firepower there I don't know it's but, unbalanced for sure uh, unbalanced and clunky yeah like it's not great yeah. and apologies uh, Doc's records worse than fourteen and fourteen they're seventeen and eighteen they were seventeen and eighteen to finish the season so below five hundred for the Milwaukee Bucks but we both go Indiana so. That's interesting. All right, so some news. We'll, pl- we'll just plow through these. We don't need to get into these too much in depth, but n- the Brooklyn Nets are down to their final three for coaching search. So they've got Bullnoza, um, but a chance there. Assistant coach Kevin Young from the Suns and Jordy Fernandez from the Kings. Bro, who do you like there? Who's got it? Who's got the job? Both those assistants have a lot of weight, but I think Bud is the uh, is going to be the choice. Um, they got a Spurs, you know, they got a Spurs background in the front office. You know, Bud Bud has sort of got a um, you know Spurs background. I, I expect that to happen. They need a they need a coach that has been looked. Their biggest problem has just been having a coach that could sort of handle things. And he's been through it all. And he was a little burnt out at the end there in Milwaukee. Uh, he's had a year, you know, year to sort of soak things up. Here's one for you, Pro. T- if you're the Milwaukee Bucks and you could re- take that decision back today, would you do it? Take back getting rid of Bud? Yeah, yeah today. absolutely. Fuck, uh, right? absolutely. Like, like, yeah, he had his issues, yeah. but they've been a train wreck yeah. since he left. Like, it's, yeah, you know, and he won you a Did- championship, and okay, yeah, the first round early exit to an ax- absolute juggernaut run by he- Miami, but like. 
He did look like he was burnt the fuck he out, looked, though. He, he looked he like did. that when he was 18 years old, though. Like, it's a good you, point. You would always say that. Like, the guy looks like he's going to have a, car, like a heart attack every play. <laughs> it's just like, Dude, I remember him as a young assistant in, in San Antonio. When I was working guys out in the summer, I'd always see him. And uh, it's unbelievable from seeing him there to seeing him after being a head coach in the NBA for a while. Yeah. But I don't know, man. Like, here's the thing, folks. Like, as an owner – and your, your your guys maybe you come in and be like, and that's why I think Miami, Pat Riley, you, you got to respect him more than anything because when those guys came in and want to fire Spo early and he's like, fuck off, you know, that's when you got to just say, hey, guys, we're going to stick with our guy. If that was the case and he wasn't burnt out and it was just the players that came in and complained about him, that's where you got to just say, hey, guys, we're not firing our coach. He's our right guy. You know, let's just sort of let's get away from each other for a while. Come back. He's our guy. We lost. So what? Made a huge run with this guy in the playoffs before. You know, I would have I would have kept the coach. I'm not really a fan of firing guys like that. And um, even though he did look burnt out, just get away from the team for a couple of months and come back. But yeah, I probably wouldn't made that decision. Oh I'd, yeah, but looking back, you'd make that decision. Right, you would would not make that decision. If you do it today yeah, yeah. and get rid of the whole Griffin experiment to Doc Rivers, you keep Bud. I mean, it's just it comes down to the the shinier toy over there, and then you play with it, and you're like, shit, it's it's not as the quality's not as good and, as the one I had. And dude, you never like when you're a championship team level team, put it this way, you never hire an assistant coach. Never. I look, Adrian Griffin, great guy, good coach, without question. He should be coaching in Toronto. He should be coaching Chicago. Mm. He should be coaching Detroit. Like he needs to Young sort of cut team, his teeth yeah. a little bit. Yeah. I just don't give it to an assistant coach. I'm sorry, I don't. You know, I, especially I know relationships uh, formed uh, with a lot of those guys as an assistant, breaking film with them. That different relationship yeah. changes. Then guys are like, oh, now you're now you're not talking to me as much because you're the head coach. Is that whole dynamic as well? I, I agree with that. That's a very valid point. Yeah. And you, you generally don't see a lot of assistants on good teams that take the job, succeed long-term, that ever really happens, right? It's usually sh you, shooter teams. Yeah, you and you fired a guy that you didn't think can take you to a place. Look, there's been certain assistants that you hire – uh, for you know, sort of really good teams. Phil Jackson, when they you know when when they fired Doug Collins, you know it's things like that. But for the most part, um, for the po most part, I, I just don't think um, I don't think getting rid of a, a coach that took you to the finals and then you replace him with an assistant. I don't care who, where the assistant's from. I think you have to hire another guy that's been battle tested and I, I just think it's a tough it's a tough deal. Yeah, I agree. All right, uh, the what, what you got? What do you think, folks? Who, who do you think is going to get it? Bud? Did you say Bud? Yeah, I think Bud will get it. I think Bud okay. will get it. Got yeah, it. I think they. Yeah, I mean they got a strange team. They got they got some some infighting there. It seems sometimes Cam Thomas and who's who's the guy on the ball, all that kind of stuff. So I'm interested to see yeah. wh where they go. Bridges, Ben Simmons, <laughs> all that all that kind of oh. stuff. So it's going to be interesting to see where that goes. The Celts extend Holiday. Drew Holiday, four years, 135 million. They'll have 187 million on the books next season, pro. That'll be good enough for second in the league, just behind Phoenix. And they'll be the league leaders in salary in the season after that. So spend a lot of cash over there. They're, they're big, big four, making a, a lot of money. But uh, I mean, Drew Holiday's a fantastic player, great two way player, perfect fit for, for what they're trying to do. And we'll see if, if it brings the old Celtics a championship. Kevin Porter Jr., pro. See where he's playing at? Yeah, w Greece. Did he play? I'm, I'm actually going over there in ju late June. Yeah, so I'm going to ask him. He's around. been playing, but he's, a, he's he's your prime example of playing in Iran, but just ended up in Greece. But uh, fucked around in the NBA. 85 million on the table, I believe. Gone, lit on fire. Playing for Park in uh, Greece it was a club that I think historically has had some bankruptcy issues and whatnot, but seemed to be okay now. But um, just amazing fall from grace. For, for that guy, um, I wouldn't say from grace. Actually, I'd say an amazing fall yeah. from from a a, f a full bank account for the rest of your life and your kid's life to now playing for a couple of euros and, and a few euros in your pocket. Yeah, I mean the the Celtic thing to go back real quick. The only thing about the signing, and it's a great signing, but the question is now are you going to be able to to re-sign Derek White with you know with the tax apron and thing that that's going to be interesting, or do you move you make some moves going forward with this? Um, yeah, it just goes to show you, it's almost impossible. If you're like any type of a good player, 
It's almost impossible not to make $100 million in the NBA these days, folks, over a course of career. If you've got any type of talent, I mean, just, I mean, the average salary is nine and a half million. That the, the cap is progressively going up. It's almost impossible to fuck this up if you already, you know, if you're already a high pick, you put some numbers up. I mean, you're going to make a hundred million. You got guys three and three will get you a hundred million these days, and you know throughout your career if you if you just know, you know if you just know how to play the game, and it just goes to show you, no one's you know no one's bulletproof with this. If you ask, act like an asshole, you know it's going to like like if you're like Giannis or you know your Luca or your Jokic, you want to act like a clown at times. Fine, you're still going to be fine, but when you're not that. And you're not that elite player, and you want to keep on burning bridges, burning bridges, burning bridges, and you keep fucking up. That's what's going to happen. And uh, you know, um, I hope you know when I go when I go to Greece to do my clinics, they tell me uh, when you're born, they teach you something in Greece, a saying, and I, don't, I forgot the saying, but I know what it means. I'll pay you tomorrow. That's oh, their avrio. that's their avrio. motto. Avrio. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, yeah because I'll pay you, you know I know that because Shane Hughes used to tell a story about when the club that he played for over there. Whenever he went in there and asked for his paycheck, they said Avrio. <laughs> yeah, that's what my guys tell me. They laugh. I love Greece, man. I fucking love Italians right here, Greeks right under. And they told me the story. I forgot the club, but like they didn't pay anybody, and everybody was gonna <laughs> just like sit out. I think I told the story in the on, on the pod before, but fuck it, I'll say it again. And everybody was fucking pissed. They were all going to walk out. They were like three months behind our pay. So they go, of course, they make the move. What They pay them in cash before practice. So what do you think you do before practice when you have this money? You don't go to the bank. You put it where? In your locker. They had a team official during practice <laughs> break into half the lockers and steal the fucking money and say, we had no idea where the fucking money was. <laughs> I love Greece. Man. It's like an Indiana Jones episode every day going in that fucking Yeah, place. Greece is great. great. Greek, Greek, we love our Greek people. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the Avrio thing, I remember that story from Shane Healy. It was like, Weeks, Avrio, Avrio, come back tomorrow. Yeah, oh, pay oh, 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 Avrio, pay Avrio, it comes back. Oh, ah, Avrio, Avrio. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, good on him. All right, um, final thing, just Julius Randle out for the season officially with right shoulder surgery, so that hurts the Knicks' chances a little bit um, considering how well they've gone, but, I mean, Brunson Fuck keep- the Knicks' chances. They fucked me too on my fucking fantasy team. Fuck your fantasy him, team. No one cares about your him, fantasy team. Ingram, dude, fuck out of here. No one cares about it. You live in reality, bro. You, you sound like uh, – like like John Tay Porter right now. <laughs> ah, pay you tomorrow. Um, some college some college stuff. So Zach Eddy calls out the NCAA. This is interesting, pro. I don't know if you're aware, but uh, international yeah. students cannot receive nil money. Do you know that? Mm-hmm. That's a joke. Yeah, I heard that. That's a joke. Yeah, that's so a joke. They need they need to fix that. Um, they cannot profit from any nil. Uh, Income, um, because I guess they're not residents, which is ridiculous. I know when I was in college, and I've told this story. I, I received when I lived off campus, I received a check, and I, it was supposed to be seven hundred and eighty bucks a, a month for rent and whatnot. And then you know, you talk to your teammates, how much do you get? Oh, that's not bad. All right, cool, I'll take that. And then by the time I got mine, it was like six forty because I got tax extra as an international student for some reason. They had a withholding or some shit, and I'm just like, yeah, what the fuck? Like, so they need to fix that. And I think Zach Eddie's got a right calling that out, especially if he can make some some income. The women's um, semi final and final, well, the finals even more. The semi final was larger than an NBA finals game, any NBA finals game in the last decade. They had eighteen point seven million viewers. Uh, so that was the final. Semi-finals are roughly the same. It peaked at 24 million pro. So um, I know I tuned in for it. Uh, I tuned in for, for the second half of it. Um, so that was that was great to watch. Obviously, the Cox got it done pro. That's the game Cox from South Carolina. I don't get any ideas there, but they, they get it done there. And UConn go back to back and and win their pro. So that was um, a great, great two-year run for them. Really, really doing well there. Uh, Hurley, Hurley, right? Yeah. Danny Hurley. So – Great story with this. I worked camp with Danny probably the 1990s, right, when he was at Seton Hall. And the whole family, his dad, one of the probably the most famous high school coach ever in the United States, you know, uh, Bobby Hurley Sr. And so, like, when Bobby was coming out, the son from Duke, he was the golden child. Danny went through some issues at Seton Hall. So did, I don't even think he finished up at Seton Hall. I think he was he left the team at one point. So like he was just coaching. He went from coaching as assistant coach with his dad, 
He was at Rutgers University as an assistant. When I was in prep school coaching, I would talk to him a lot about when he was at Rutgers. Then he went from there to coach in high school in New Jersey. St. Benedict's a pretty good high school team. Then he went from there to Wagner, killed it at Wagner. Now, Bobby gets in a car accident. One of the best point guards in NCAA history gets in a car accident and never really plays in the NBA after after the second year. And then he just like, he was an assistant with, with Danny when he was at Wagner. And then he gets the URI, uh, URI job, URI, UConn. And the one thing about Danny, he's always been a prick. And he's a good guy, but he's like, he never changed his ways. And he's the perfect coach, I think, in my opinion, to coach kids today. He doesn't tilt for anybody. And his his dad's sort of like that, but a lot more like charismatic when he does it. Danny's just a flat prick. And he's been a prick his whole <laughs> life. And I think it helps him as a coach mm. because if you watch him, he's the funniest guy ever. Like going after refs, like he doesn't coddle players. He like coaching fundamental. I mean, he's... He's really good, and that team has been a – like, I'll just be honest. College on the men's side hasn't been really fun in the last few years. And you watch them play, and they just move the ball. They've got a couple of names, but nothing that, like, that not, that like takes you like, oh, this guy, you know, a no-brainer, NBA all-star. Da, da, da. He just has the good kids that play hard. He coaches them hard, and they're fun to watch. And uh, on the thing on the girls' side – I will say this, it's not even close the last year or two as far as the excitement on the girls' side and the boys' side. And I don't really care. I don't get into the men and women things. But I will tell you this, that it's a physical game. They go at each other, and they're ready to fight 24-7, that girls. Uh, especially like the LSU, UConn, um, you know, South Carolina, teams like that. Characters, the coaching characters. Mm. Be, you need that shit though. Like that's yeah. what sells. Like that's why the LSU Caitlin Clark battle um, was so good because it was all bullshit. And then, I mean, people were trying to make yeah. it a white black shit, which is just getting ridiculous. Oh but, no, but, it's bullshit. Yeah. But you had all this underlying tension. You know, um, LSU was a rough and tough team. They're going to beat up, and then Caitlin's you know shooting from half. Like it was, it was just awesome dynamic to watch. Um, and that's what sells. That's what women's sports. And what I like about it is. You know, we often historically have tried to, I guess, over pump up uh, women's sports at times. This is just natu- yeah. this is this is naturally happening. And that's what you want. You want it to naturally transcend itself. You don't want you don't want it to be inflated by government or inflated to yeah. be, be told like you need to watch this and support this, which which has been the WNBA a lot. It's been you need to support this or, or, or you're sexist mm-hmm. or this or that or we need more money or we need this. This is just naturally progressing because of natural storylines of, you know, it, it's fun to watch, you know, there's the dynamic of the on court, the off court, like you said, the coaches are characters within themselves, players are talking shit to each other. That's, that's what sells naturally. Um, that's an argument I have a lot with the NBL is, you know, some of the stuff they do from a clickbait point of view is it doesn't need to be done anymore because it's, 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 it's naturally starting to happen. And we're seeing that. And, you know, you get, you get 24 million at the peak and 90 million people watching that's a pretty good result. You don't need all the extra drama and extra bullshit that, that has historically been put out there to try and pump up the sport. It's happening because of the sport. Look, I, I work with two WNBA All-Stars. They both play here in Dallas. And I tell them all the time, I said, look, you know, when we talk about it, I say, look, NBA players and WNBA players cannot be paid the same. They don't deserve it right now. I said, you got to treat your league right now like the NBA was in the 70s. You know, some decent salaries here and there, but for the most part, you, most people can't really make a living off it yet. You got to continue to build it through, and you got to continue to to pump good players into it. You can't just like have these people donate money and then oh yeah we gotta you gotta up the salaries. No, like the NBA works because it's collectively bargained. You get the BRI, you know, it's split fifty fifty. You take half the BRI, you divide it by thirty. There's your salary cap. You know, for, um, you know your max level players get twenty five percent of the cap. It works financially. You can't just inject all this like fake money into your league and pay people because at some point you got to pay that money back. So you got to continue to have really good players. You got to continue to sell the brand of it. 
and you will get, you know, you will probably see max contracts in the WNBA right now. It's at about 270,000. You will see half a million, three quarters of a million to a million dollar max contracts within the next five or six years. In my opinion, the way the league's going, you got uh, Caitlin Clark. Now, if you got a few more players like that every few years, if you keep on coming, these the girls players, especially if you watch with the high school level, they're really getting good. And if you know, like, there's going to be more and more, pub, you know, publicity with the sport. People are going to like it. They're not going to love it like the NBA, where you're getting thirty million, forty million. That's just bullshit. But you will just continue to sort of build this up slowly. But you can't be like, oh, we got to get paid like the guys. No, it's not like that. You got to have the money. You have to have the BRI continue to improve, where you can now have something to, you know, collectively bargain. And now you, you know, it's more revenue. It, you, you know, you have some of these WNBA players that just speak moronically about, oh, you know, it's revenue sharing, revenue. Sharing. You don't know what you're talking about. You know, <laughs> you have no revenue. There's very little of it. Now it's rising. And now you see it with the college game getting better. AU, high school, big level high school and, and girls side. It's getting better. But it just it's got to continue to build. But like I said, I, I compare the WNBA now to the, the, the NBA in like the 70s. I'm not talking about the names. I'm talking about just sort of the financial the finances standpoint. Of it, the, yeah, of course. The interest, yeah. 100%. And yeah. it's happening organically. That's what you want. You want it to happen. People, people yeah. can tell the difference between something that's fake and trying to be propped up more than it right. isn't to something that's natural. And this is organically happening. So um excited to see where, where it all goes. And, um, you know, Caitlin Clark's a big, big reason for that. All right, to our – Aussies of the week. It's our last one of the season. Um, we'll go through these real quick. Jack White was with the Grizzlies for the last couple of games. He was at 1.5 points, three rebounds, one steal in four games. So good to see him out there. Dante Exum, 4.7 points, four rebounds, 3.1 assists. Dyson Daniels, eight points, five rebounds, 3.2 assists, 1.5 steals. Josh Green, 3.6 points and 3.3 rebounds, 1.6 assists. Looks super rusty since he got back from his injury. Does not look like he's got that form back. He just doesn't look like he's got the same legs or burst that he had coming back from that injury. Joe Ingles, 3.8 points, 2.2 rebounds, three assists a game. Pro's guy, Jock Landale, 9.6 points, 3.1 rebounds. Got to get him rebounding, Pro. 3.1 rebounds with the minutes he's playing. It seems like he's just AAU focusing on uh, scoring on that on that team because uh, his rebounding is definitely down. We got to get him up back up there, Bro. He's actually boxing out, so it's tough. He, he's taking more for the team. So get some overboards. You know, get that, some overboards. Yeah, that's yeah. Here's I think an, he's doing all right. Here's an interesting one: Patty Mills, after arriving in Miami and starting upon arrival, has not played since March 29. Um, obviously, they had some injuries at that point, but he went from starting from back up to starting his second game, starting third, fourth, fifth game. Guys came back. Has not played a minute since the 29th of March. So. We were pumped that he was playing for the Boomers' chances, but now he's not again, so that's not a great thing, and they're probably going to make a little run in the playoffs. Matisse, still out injured with that ankle that he came back from, hasn't played for the rest of the season. Josh Giddy, 13.2 points, 7.5 rebounds, 6.8 assists. Ben Simmons obviously out for the season, and Dwight breathed 7.2 and 4 rebounds. Josh Giddy gets it this week, pro. He is the champion again, uh, shockingly, but yeah, he, he's a, he's a five-time winner. No one really... Uh, really was was nipping at his heels. Dante Exum had two for the season. He was the next closest. We thought Ben Simmons would be in there, but didn't really play much this season. Jock did get a charity one from Pro because he felt bad for him. Um, charity? What, he's crazy? Giddy was 18, had, eight by the way, was the, 18, by the eight way, like, seven that, that week or something like that. By the way, two games ago, Jock had like 18 and seven, by the way. Yeah. Just, yeah. So, just so we know. Yeah. No, I, I, just so I, we I know. did the stats. I just told, I just, I just told you the two-week period was... Nine point six and, and three point one. I'm glad the Rockets. I'm glad the Rockets got over their concussion and actually started fucking playing the kid. I agree with that. And watch what happened when they play it. Yeah, he he deserves so, to be. He's an NBA player. Deserves to be in lineups. I don't know what the hell they were doing in the first. I mean, oh, it's a concussion. I'm I'm glad it cleared up. Yeah, they, they, they cleared it up. up. But Josh Giddy, congratulations! You are the Aussie of the week champion. You're the Aussie player of the year according to the Road Bogues podcast. So I'm sure you'll hold that award in high esteem when you get some trophies made. Under protest this week's under protest, but that's just me. For who? who who'd you have I mean, this so, week then? Oh, Jock Lando, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Your bias is showing. All right, stats, useful or useless, pro. It is the NBA net free throw attempt differential pro since the start of the 22-23 season. This is wild. So this is basically the differential between teams playing each other. So... If you get plus four, your your team shoots more than four three throws this game, and then 
they shoot more seven more free throws than the other team the next game that turns into 11 and that's how they calculate that right so it's not necessarily you're not necessarily leading the league in free throw attempts but it's just your differential against other teams the lakers pro you know, in a two year span here we go 1017 free throw attempt differential which is wild when you look at who's second the new york knicks 358 pro. <laughs> that is wild. That's the second That's crazy. over that span. You got you got the Milwaukee Bucks at 344, Orlando Magic at 311. Um, and then we go to Boston, Miami, the Clippers. The bottom half, who would you have as dead last if you had to or well, you've already seen it, but who would you would you have guessed they'd be dead last, pro? The Golden State Warriors are dead last. Uh, they do shoot a lot of jumpers, but Dead last at minus their differential differential is minus six hundred and forty six a game. Indiana yeah. second at at minus five thirty three. I, I guess that's. I mean, even though style of play predicated, a, yeah, yeah, style of play for sure. Even though Steph does have the ball on his hands a lot, he drives, he gets fouled. But yeah, it's crazy when you think about it, though. You know, as far as Golden State being the last, I I, I was I was really shocked. At that at that point, um, what's what, yeah, what's also I, interesting about this graph, bro? They're really the only big market team on the on the minus side of the graph. <laughs> I mean, you can count I mean, look at Washington, but they suck. But they're all small market, if, like Indiana, Detroit, San Antonio, OKC, Brooklyn. OKC are good, right? They should be on the other side. Uh, Washington, Denver, Phoenix, Portland, Minnesota, Cleveland, Chicago is a big market team, but they suck. And Houston and Memphis are all in the minus. <laughs> Coincidentally, the big market teams are all on the left side, but they're plus. But the pro, the Lake is a thousand seventeen, man. That is insane, especially when you consider what we've said before. They're one of the one of the teams that does not touch the paint much from the perimeter on drives. Yes, they counter that by posting up, but they're not posting up that much more than it's not like they're posting up five x these other teams to have three to, almost three times the amount free throw differential in the two year period is just insane. But you know, it's it's a little nutty, Bogues, unless my numbers are off. Like, you don't have anybody with that's averaging more than ten free throws a game for the Lakers. So you would think that that they, they would have like AD and LeBron would have like ten point one and nine point eight, you know, free throws attempts a game. You get six point eight, five point seven uh, for the leaders there. I mean, then then you get like a three point three, a two point five. Point pro. A two point so that's where it's deceiving because people will look at free throw att- like team free throw attempts per game and it's never the Lakers. But when you play them, you're not hitting your number. That's the difference. Yeah, that's crazy. So you're if you're averaging twenty a night, twenty free throws a night, you play the Lakers, you're gonna get ten that night. And then that's where the differential yeah. comes into play. That's where they get you. And it's it's clear yeah. they get a friendly whistle. You you know, Lakers fans, they have a cry on social media every other day about it. No, we're not fa- it's clear you're fa- you you're getting a pretty friendly whistle over the course of two years. These stats don't lie. Um, yes, you post right. up a little bit more than other teams, but you're severely behind other teams on paint touches from perimeter, perimeter drive. So I think it balances out, and you should be definitely not first in the league. It's just unbelievable. That's definitely a useful stat, pro, and I'm sure you agree. Oh, for sure. Yeah, it just tells you that you know, like you said, friendly whistle, and you know, that's uh, yeah, that uh, that free throw differential is pretty. That is pretty spectacular if you think about it. All right, we'll talk about some MVP candidates from the last couple of seasons. Nikola Jokic this season, pro, he's played 75 games, okay, 75 games, Mm -hmm. and he's had 419 free throw attempts. Joel Embiid, injury-riddled season, he's played 37 games, so just under half of the amount of games played. 433 attempts from the free throw line, pro. So he's had had, uh, 14 more free throw attempts than the other MVP candidate in 38 less games. Useful or useless? Uh, uh, it's pretty useful. And it's amazing when you look at that, where an MVP can- you know, candidate in Jokic is averaging 5.5. Now, Embiid's el- uh, eliminated from any postseason awards because of the missed games, mm-hmm. but he's averaging 11.6 free throws attempted a game. It's it's insane. He's a foul hunter like, more than Jokic, but it's still yeah. it's still pretty bad. Like it's, I think yeah. Jokic yeah. doesn't get the friendliest whistle at times, and that's why we see him lose his mind. It's almost like monthly he chases a ref down the sideline. He gets frustrated. He just gets, yeah, he gets out. frustrated. He's like a cartoon character, but yeah, <laughs> when he when he when he gets mad, he's something. He's like a cartoon character. It is yeah, pretty he, funny. He gets an unfriendly whistle. I think that's useless just to show that. He, 
I think it shows that Joel's definitely a foul hunter. Um, interested to see how they referee. I'm interested to see actually how they referee Joel in the playoffs because the referees have clearly changed their tack the last month or two, and mm-hmm. Embiid hasn't really been on the floor because he's been hurt. Whether whether that cha- whether that stays the same and even even gets more like we're not calling your your foul chasing. I wonder how that goes in the playoffs, but that's a useful one for me, pro. Um, what about you? I think it's useful for sure. Just it's an interesting stat. Definitely with uh, the amount of games that he's missed and the amount of free throws compared to, you know, and compared to Jokic. And again, just the, 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 the you know, just the, the difference in numbers is, is it's pretty staggering. But yeah, I, I definitely think it's useful. Yeah, useful. All right, Russell Westbrook has the most dunks by a point guard in NBA history, pro, with 652. Not a big dunk guy, but yeah, it's pretty useful. I mean, to have the number one in any stat, you know, for a career for point guards, you think about it. I don't even know athletic point guards like that that would have a lot of dunks like that, but it's incredible that, you know, with the, the amount that he's had. Yeah, you I know, agree. You think about it, folks. Is there anybody even close? That's what I was thinking. Like, Who would be second? <laughs> like, Iverson, maybe? I don't no, think Iverson no, dunked no, like that. No, Iverson, no. Iverson. Iverson didn't dunk? No, I mean. He had a few early I'm on, thinking, but no, nah, it'd be. Magic? I don't know. Like, I have no. Magic. Yeah, maybe I doubt Magic. It. Ma- maybe Magic. Um, I mean, yeah, it wasn't, a wasn't very many. You know, Pe- Stock- Stockton. Penny too. Hardaway was, was hurt. Penny, I guess, yeah. Very- Penny, 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 yeah. Penny maybe was still be, yeah. be in a couple of hundreds. D. Rose got 102 dunks in his There you go. Oh, so he forgot about Derrick Rose. Yeah, yeah, D. Rose forgot if- about Derrick Rose. <laughs> yeah, oh, John Morant, will be, John Morant will be up there too. John Morant's going to be up if, there. John- if he stays healthy and away from his- uh, Pistol. Away from his his pistol, he'll, uh, he'll be fine. Okay. All right, uh, last one. Jalen Williams- He's shooting an NBA leading 81% from the field in the clutch. Mm-hmm. And he's 18 total points in the fourth quarter this season, pro. So it's important stat to the, the later part, 18 total points in the fourth this season, just because, you know, the 81% can be misleading if he's only had three or four attempts, right? Or, or 10 attempts, but he's uh, eight in total points in the fourth this season. So they've, they've found an absolute gem there um, for them uh, throughout the course of the season, pro. Useful, useless. Uh, that's pretty. That's pretty useful. I mean, Jalen Williams is, uh, you know, just another another great draft pick by Sam Presti in the in Oklahoma City. The guy's cool, calm, and collected. He takes good shots. You know, collectively as a unit, they're the best three point shooting team in the in the NBA. They don't take a lot of them either. They take great ones. They, uh, but he he is a very like you don't look at him as a polarizing figure in the NBA. I, I probably wouldn't even have him in the top twenty five players in the league, but he's very cool, calm and collected. He could drop twenty, twenty five. You know, he shoots great shots. He doesn't try to overdo it. But yeah, I think it's a I think it's a pretty useful stat. Agree. Yeah, clutch players in him, especially now. You know, we saw a lot of the giddy minutes go down go down with 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 Williams's kind of rise. Um, so I think uh, you know having that in the playoffs, I think it's going to be very very valuable for them. All right, pro, you can kick back and, and open a drink. We're into NBL free agency now. Uh, a lot has gone on over the course of you know forty eight hours officially. Um, but I had you know we had a lot of a lot of uh, free agency deals got done yesterday when, when they opened pro at uh, you know nine a.m. We had an influx of, of deals signed. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm looking forward to hearing about him. All right, so Kawhi Noy returning to Sydney Kings on a multi-year deal. Uh, Trent, chime in when you want, but we'll, we'll go through all the names and then discuss ones that stand out for you. Uh, Parker Jackson Cartwright returning to the Breakers on a one-year deal. As much as I hate playing against him, I love this. I love seeing great imports return, so well done to the Breakers there. Jack Jump has re-signed their championship winning duo of, of Anthony Drimmick and Majuk Deng. Joe Luala Chul has declined his player option with Melbourne United and we'll, we'll explore opportunities overseas he did not look happy uh for most of the season there he just looked very very grumpy didn't look look like himself in the playoffs i think there was a off-court issue death in the family or something along those lines i don't know what was going on but didn't look like it loved his time in his second stint in united chris golding has res- resigned with uh, united until 27 wardenberg will stay in cans on a one-year deal the brisbane boards announced the return of Tyrell harrison casey prather mitch norton and isaac white for next season uh they all had their contract options exercised Wildcats bring back Ty, Ty Webster with a club option. Uh, Corey Webster was declined, so he will depart. Kyle Zunick uh, has played 40 games for Perth over the last couple of seasons, has also departed. Jackson McCoy and the Sydney Kings have agreed to a mutual release. He will sign with the Kansas Taipans. Jesse Wagstaff, one-year deal. 
16th season, he's hobbling up and down still, um, flopping all over the place. But uh, I, I say that in jest. He's, a, he's a, a very, very good player for them. I think a very good, from the guys I talk to, a very good head in their locker room, knows what they're about. Um, be interesting to see if he stays in the rotation at a minute level as as he wasn't towards the end of that second half of the season. McDown White declined his player option with the Breakers. Um, chasing big money. So I'm, I'm interested to see the rumours are Brisbane or Adelaide's been thrown in there, maybe Southeast Melbourne. Um, but now with Sobe going there, I doubt that happens. But uh, interested to see where he goes. Uh, Illawarra Hawks, Wani Swaka, Lobo Lucas signed on a three-year deal, former King. Uh, Bull Kowal. Excited, excited to, to have this guy sign with the Sydney Kings to sign the Sydney Kings. So we've been after this guy for a number of years and finally got it done with a three-year deal. So we really think his ceiling's high. One of the few high-level two-way Australians playing in the NBL. So we're excited about that one. Jonah Bolden departs the Kings, signs with the New Zealand Breakers on a one-year deal. Mitch McCarron, two-year deal with the New Zealand Breakers. Mahav King, Mojave King. Uh, signing with the Breakers on a one-year deal. Sydney Kings have signed forward Kelly Lepepe on a three-year deal. Not sure if you've seen this guy pro, but he was at LMU, a big football player-looking guy with a massive mullet. Uh, we signed him. Ha! Islander from Australia, Islander background, awesome, just an absolute animal. Like they said, he just eats weights when he goes in the weight room, just throws all kinds of shit around. But if you Google him, he's he's a, a man mountain, not very tall, six 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 seven. But mm-hmm. um, as wide as he is tall, so we're pumped to get him. Lat Mayan returning home to Adelaide on a one-year deal. Dengadel has signed with a one-year deal in Brisbane. Interested to see how that goes after his last in the NBL wasn't great. Karen Galloway, two-year deal with the Cairns Taipans. Jack Jumpers, Jack Jumpers have signed Gorja Gak on a two-year deal. Kings have signed Tyler Robinson on a three-year deal. Robertson on a three-year deal from um, the University of Portland. He's similar field to, to, to DJ uh, Vasilevich, kind of like a – a bigger bodied guard that can really, really get hot in a, in a flurry. So we're excited to see he, where he goes. Isaiah Liafa also signed with the Sydney Kings after opting out of his deal with New Zealand. We get him on a two year deal. Pumped about that one as well. It really shores up our bench. Uh, Mel, Nathan Sobey has signed with the Southeast Melbourne Phoenix for the next two seasons. What stands out, Tr- uh, Trenton, that one for you? I think you guys, to be honest, honestly, just because you guys have signed the most, and but like the way you guys have solidified your bench, like I think Isaiah Liafa doesn't get enough credit for what he was able to do for New Zealand over the last two years, and he he was a big part of if McDowell White got in foul trouble, if PJC got in foul trouble, he was really able to come on and still provide offense for the team, get them through their sets. So I think he's a massive one. And then obviously Bull Cole. Bull Cole is probably like one of the more slept on guys in the NBL. But like what he was able to do in Cairns that one year where they were the second, third seed with Pinder. Like a lot of people gave a lot of credit to Pinder and the and DJ Hogue there. But I think Bull Cole defensively um, as well as offensively was like the kind of the heart of that team and was the reason they were so competitive. So like what you guys have been able to do in terms of reassuring your bench. But I think the big one will be McDowell White and where he trying to opts to go. Like you can see the breakers are kind of by signing McCarron and BJC are moving, kind off. Of moving off him. You know, you can see they kind of got insurances in place that if he doesn't return, you know, they'll be okay in that point guard spot. But like um, if he can go to Brisbane, I think, I think that's a massive move for, for the bullets. I think him being a 26, 27 year old, he's probably not reached his ceiling yet. And He's already shown that he can lead a team into the NBL finals, five game series and and kind of like that series against Kings, he was by far the best player for New Zealand and was the only reason they were kind of in that series, I feel. Like they had great imports. Um, I know their center was super solid, but Will McDowell White was like the cause of that whole mm. that whole run there. And I think if he can come to Brisbane with some decent building blocks around him and they kind of keep doing what they're doing. And I think everything else is kind of a bit of bit of nothing like yeah. Perth Perth getting rid of like kind of older guys retaining some of their younger guys you know anything southeast melbourne do is kind of just nothing mm. in my opinion <laughs> yeah. like it's great Sobey's going there returning home all that it's a great story but i don't know how him and Mitch Creek well, work. that experiment's been back. done before in yeah. Adelaide, yeah. And like they made the finals and it was good but they were also in very different part, like moments in their career like yeah. i just can't see them being able to replicate that so that's neither here or there. Cairns is kind of in that same boat. Like, you know, they've blown up that team like two or three times in a row now. And like they might get momentum and make a play-in push if if they can get the right kind of culture there. But with that, everything that happened with Tajir and, and Bull, it doesn't sound like – I think people are kind of getting a bit getting off not, 40 yeah, yeah. getting a bit over that. So 
I don't know. United's the, another big question mark. Um, JLA going is is obviously massive for them, and you could you could definitely see he didn't feel like he was getting the shots he deserved or the touches he felt like he probably should have had towards the end of the season. There, like he had big games in Brisbane where he was getting twenty plus shots, but then the other games it was going to Ian Clark, Goulding, yeah. And I don't think he he appreciated that Delhi, too much. Yeah. Delhi, yeah, hundred percent. Huck Bordy's yeah. out too. I think his two if year he, next idea all yeah, lapses. So. And like he'll be entering the draft, and it's more than likely he'll get drafted at in late first round or even the second round. So he's pretty much guaranteed gone, I would say. So yeah. whether or not they, there's rumours around Whitey coming back to Melbourne to kind of fill yeah. maybe that Travers role too, because Travers is another big one. Like he could go play summer league, pick up a two-way with the Cavs. Yeah, like. well, similar to Galloway with us. I mean, you know, we're, you know we, we want him to be successful, but at the same time, if, if he – Gets waived, he comes back to us. But yeah, it's it's a bittersweet for both both sides. Um, it's tough when the NBA gets involved with those younger guys. Yeah, one hundred percent. So if I'm the rest of the league, I'm looking at what you guys are doing, and like, and I'm a bit worried, especially with Cooks coming back. You guys have your bench pretty much sorted. I really like Malawak as another guy that yeah. I haven't mentioned. He he's a great player. He in the North. I don't know how much people watch the NBL one, but like, it. he is one of the best players in the league. And now he's also playing with Quat up in Darwin. So they're going to get minutes together. I just really like what you guys have done. I think Melbourne will probably be able to put another good team together. They still got Delhi, Chris, you know, their core. So I think it's you two. And then it will be interesting. I think McDowell white could be a swinger, like whoever he goes to. He also could- at Perth as a, as another name that was thrown out there, but if they, if they bring him in their their cap is going to be huge. Um, they're going to be overspending um, to the buggery if they get him, but he was another, an, there was another team that I heard. And how, how would him and Cotton even work? I feel like Cotton's yeah. so ball dominant and Will needs the ball to, to be to, effective. And that's a thing. That's what I think if you got Cotton, you need to build, you, you need the, the Norton, Damian Martin guys that don't need the ball, that do all the dirty work. And that's where I think they struggled this year. They had both the Webster brothers need the ball. They had a lot of guys that were ball dominant. Pinder needs his touches every now and then. Like it's no longer a Nick K that's like Nick K was happy to get six shots some nights and be like, oh, we won. Bryce had 40. Whereas you could see Pinder was becoming frustrated at times and not getting touches. So, um, yeah, interesting. And and just from the Kings, you know, we we're, we're real high on, on our on our on our youth as well. The Pepe and Robinson Robertson are really shoring up our bench um, and, and getting some young pieces there. And then and then yeah, Le, you know, Liafa and Brucey off the bench defensively. Uh, uh, you know, people people forget that Liafa is a very good defender. You know, uh, he picks up full court, gets in guys. So we're real happy with, with with that so far. And now we have you know we have some some cash to obviously spend on some imports, which is going to be the hard thing. Le Pepe's build is like that that sleeper six six wide body build. Like there's been a lot of dudes who've come in the league and been so successful. Well in the NBL. They're, they're, Luke Longley talks about it all the time. It's like these these low center of gravity Jay Sean Tate types. Yeah. That uh, you look at him and you're like, oh, he's undersized because he's six five, six six, and they just absolutely run right in this league. And he's that's what we we identified him a long, long time ago, and we're like, that, that's our guy from college. We got to go after this guy, and he had some suitors, and we, and we ended up getting it done. So we're we're real pumped, and he's. By reports, both those young guys are great. They're actually both friends too, so um, they're, they're both good in a locker room and whatnot. So we're yeah, we're excited, and, and I think the NBL. Shout out to the NBL. I know we we sometimes you know uh, get after them about certain things, but I thought the free agency um, live stream was a nice touch, something that hasn't been done before. I think that was cool. I mean, Trent, you were a little bit critical of Olgan and and his and his uh wo- these live Woj bombs. I just texted Olg before the uh, Olgan before the podcast and said your acting was bad when he's getting the live. Oh, breaking news on my phone, and he claims two of them. He said claims two of them were legit, so we're gonna have to go back to the film and and find out which ones he was acting about. But uh, I think it was a good thing to be able to do that. Uh, it brought I know a lot of people tuned into that and were watching that, and and just good to get some buzz around free agency rather than just seeing it all in text and print. It was actually a show you could go to and be like, oh, I heard this. I'm going to go tune into it. And I know they had a pretty good viewership for it. So that was that was good. Uh, strangest one of the off season so far for me was Simon Mitchell and the Southeast Melbourne Phoenix. Uh, former head coach for four years from 19 to 23. He's now the GM of basketball ops. I, I know Tommy Grease, I don't know what his title was, but he was basically the GM. Don't know what that entails for him. Is he kind of being shuffled to a CEO role? Are they shuffling him out of the door? But a guy that, I mean, Southeast Melbourne weren't a, weren't a failure as a startup club, <clears throat> but I wouldn't say they were successful. They absolutely choked off that COVID year to Melbourne. They should have won that game and went on from that playoff series. Simon Mitchell's 
you know, 10 years coach. Okay, in my opinion, not horrible, not not great, but just a strange one, just a strange one to bring back in your fold after uh, after coaching there. It's got to be a little bit strange. Um, Justin Schuler, would you like to – so for everyone uh, following at home, obviously Nathan Sobey, it was announced weeks ago that he would be leaving – I, I my, my the rumors I heard was he wanted an extension with the bullets. He had a year left. The bullets said nope, not giving you the extension. So he said, "Well, writing's on the wall for me then. See you later." Uh, club MVP won their awards, um, you know. And look, Sobi is a is a an intense figure. On the, he's got a scowl. He's up and in. He's passionate. Um, can be deceived as as you know people think that bad attitude, but from being around him, he's a quiet. Uh, kind of introvert guy that plays with a lot of passion and physicality and, and emotion. So these comments I just wanted to play real quick and have a quick discussion on. Uh, Justin Schuller, very good morning to you, mate. Appreciate you stepping out of your meeting and, and having a chat to us. Can, can you talk us through the Nathan Sobey situation? Good morning. Thanks for having me, mate. Um, yeah, really, this decision wasn't so much about Nathan, but more about how do we continue to move forward as a club and, and build a true contender that can sustain success. And you know, Nathan's an outstanding player and has been a good servant of the club, but we really felt that we need to lean more into our culture and our habits that we, we believe in every single day that are going to get us the ultimate success. And so as we look at things as we move forward and, and where we need to improve, um, that's where it started for us. And, you know, we're excited about the new direction we're going in. Um, you know, we see Tassie go and win the, the title. We, we know we, we got them twice this season and, and dropped one by one shot. And so we look at them and, and know we're not too far away. And the frustration missing out on percentage, um, we just have to get better. And that's what we're excited about. See, I mean, you look at those numbers that the Nathans have been able to produce and he wins your MVP. But again, that decision, so cult- it was a cultural decision. Uh, collectively, we just feel like we needed to continue to lean into bringing winners into the club and how we can continue Ooh. to grow in that space. Ouch. And, yeah, we, we can't shy away from Nathan's production, but we also know that there's other areas at both ends of the floor that we need to improve. And, and the only way we could do that continuing to move forward was to, to make a tough call and that's the part now that we can do is go and get the, the pieces that we absolutely need to know the, what it's going to take to go and get a championship for this ball club. That was courtesy of SEN Brisbane or Leave or um, it's here in Queensland but uh, before we get into it Nathan Sobey was asked about it <clears throat> he is quoted as saying that's not what I'm about throwing people under the bus I don't agree with it and I think it's pretty average but I'll let my basketball do the talking um, I think it's horrendous I think it's no matter what you think about Nathan Serby, he was your guy. He was your number one guy. He was, I think, almost was he leading scorer or close to? Um, yeah, he was leading scorer one season. Of the he league, almost right? won the MVP that year. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, obviously they've had an issue with each other. Um, Shula's come in as a new coach, didn't have him selected. He was already on the team. But if I'm an NBL player or a star player, I'm looking at that like. Do I want to sign in Brisbane for a year or two? Do I, Will McDowell White, do you want to do you want to sign in Brisbane right now, knowing that if you have a bad season, your coach is going to throw you under the bus? This is a conversation you have in your boardroom with your GM and you know your your coaching staff. You have that conversation, and 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 when you're asked about it publicly, you say, you know, we wish Nathan all the best. Um, he was sensational for our club. He was leading scorer. He swept our awards, and you leave it at that. Um, when you and then not only that, if you don't have the ball, balls to call him out, don't do it passive aggressively. Don't do it with, we want to bring winners here. <laughs> we want a, a better culture. So you're basically saying Nathan Serby was bad for your culture. He wasn't a winner. That's that's pretty fucked up. So if, you got, if you're going to say that, have the balls to call him out. But I think this is in a, in a league with 10 teams, with only a handful of marquee Australian players, this is not, not a good thing. And I just think it's very poor. I think... Shula's used Sobey as an excuse as to why they didn't make it to take some pressure off himself. Citing the Tasmania, we beat Tassie twice. Who gives a shit? You know they won the championship. That's our barometer. It feels very Doc Rivers ish. These comments, it really does. It feels like I'm I'm taking the attention away from the re, you know we failed as a team. I'm the head coach. I'm the head of the snake. But someone else's fault, and that's not good. As a head coach, it might be someone else's fault. You might have a star player or injuries, but you, you got to take it on the chin. You're the head coach, but it's just not good, pro. You were uh, shaking your head and oh-guiding during the audio. Yeah, you know me, like, I don't mind, I don't mind, like, 
telling the truth and all that, but you don't do that. That's 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 bush league bullshit. Like you don't do it. It's just it's something that you don't do. Um, even if you had a like, look, if you're on the defense and the player went off on you, all all bets are, are off. Yeah, you do are off. you do what you got to do. And there's still coaches but, that'll take the high road on that as well, right? Like there's yeah, still, yeah, yeah. It's a small league for man. sure. Yeah, 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 but you don't you don't do that. You know, you're like what what are you doing? You know, it's just that passive aggressive stuff's gonna get you. Yeah, I don't know how it is done in Australia. Um, as far as like, you know, do you have your GM when we talk about players like that? Like, as far as like making comments on players, does a coach have to be hush hush about it? Maybe not. But like, if I'm a GM or I'm running the team, I'm like, dude, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, yeah. like this is why this is why head coaches don't make good GMs because of this shit. Because it's of emotional, yeah. they take shit personal, way more personal than some GM. Most GMs do. I'm not saying GMs are above that because there 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 are a few that are not, but I just think that's a bad look, man. I don't even know what happened. You know, I, I'm the butt of the joke when anything goes on in Australia because I don't pay attention that much. <laughs> but that I don't know what went on. But you don't say that about a player. You just say, "Hey, look, it was a tough decision. We, you know, we talked about it as an organization. We had to move forward." That's it. Leave it alone yeah, and just move. I agree. Like, there's just- no reason. Like I said, unless you're gonna play defensive on it. And there's all like they they do a full skill attack on you, and then you're just playing defense. Yeah, by far they set it up, but you know I don't know. You don't do that shit. And and this is you know this is a guy that was relatively healthy, played through multiple injuries, um, you know, and, and and gave all that he had. Now it didn't result in wins, but he he left. It. He's a guy that you can't. You can't say, look, does he have the best shot selection at times? Sometimes he overforces, yes, but he was the head of their snake. He had to continuously probe and and be that guy because they didn't really have a whole lot of help down there. They made some 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 pretty poor recruiting decisions at times <clears throat> for their roster makeup. They had some injury bugs, numerous coaching changes. <laughs> um, you know, they 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 famously hired their head, their GM as a head coach for a couple of couple of games and then went back on it, and then their assistant coach and. It was it was crazy. So you just don't like don't like to see that. And I think you'd hope Shula learns from that um, because that's, that's that's pretty poor in my opinion. All right, pro. Hey, Kenny Smith. He's he's signed here in Australia, pro, as the head of the Next Stars program, um, which is very interesting. I think it's a name signing more than it is anything else. Um, as part of his salary, he will receive partial ownership of a future NBL expansion franchise. <laughs> Which is so you've interesting in itself because you've given away a portion of an NBL franchise that doesn't yet exist. But um, how many high schools do you think Kenny Smith's going to attend? How many high school games on the behalf of the NBL Next Stars program to scout for some star players over here, bro? I don't know, man. He he runs some a he runs an AU team actually run out of Atlanta. Uh, I just read that the other day. But this is where I need you and Trent as my agents over there. It should be the pro. <laughs> position not fucking kenny smith but uh yeah it's it, it's yeah you go over name that's great but I, I wouldn't expect a guy grinding out high you know at high school games looking for your best your best quality players but uh it's an it's an interesting hire uh nonetheless like you would have thought that they would have got a guy that's connected to high school coaches runs a scouting service you know someone that's like connected to high school programs high school players you know, has got a name that you could actually get players, not oh, I watched I watched Kenny on TNT. I think I'm gonna go to, and play in Australia next year. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah, I think it's a name name hiring. I don't think I don't think old Kenny's doing the, the high school scouting grind in, in, no. in fifty odd states. But let's see how it goes. It's, it brings a little bit of good attention to the NBA uh, NBL as far as PR and marketing, but as we know, that only gets you so far. But I'd hope the NBL has a team below that level that's helping with that stuff. And just finally Jacob Wiley, um, a veteran import from the Adelaide 36ers, has absolutely whacked the club on his way out. Uh, Adelaide, obviously not not the greatest couple of years uh, with, with, with a number of factors, but he, he's, he's, his comment was, came back with pure intentions to help change the culture of the club. This is obviously his second stint with Adelaide. And bring good energy. Wanted to be in Adelaide long term, but I guess I'm not worth it. Not even a phone call from staff or management to discuss the future either way when the season ended. I'm hurt, but we'll get over it. And I still wish the best for Adelaide because of the fans' unwavering support. Even when we were a disaster, they kept showing up, selling out the arena, and supporting us. That meant 
the world to me. So a little bit of a whack there and, and rightful. I mean, you got to, you got to at least call your guy or his agent and be like, Hey, you know, you're not in our plans next season. Thanks for everything. See you later. Um, but he obviously felt he didn't receive that. All right. The boomers squad pro, um, don't cut Jock Landale this time. Like he did a couple of years ago. <laughs> Uh, but it's uh, we'll go through the immediate squad announcement. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Chris Goulding, Ingles, Nick Kay, Dante Exum, Furphy, Mills, Sweet. DJ Vasilevich, Sam Froling, Rocco, Reith, Giddy, Magne, Dyson, Daniels, Green, Wormick Down White, Jack McVay, Pinder, Cooks, Jack White, Thibel, uh, Jock Landale, and Delhi. Hard team to pick. They've gone. They've gone an extended squad of twenty. I think it's twenty two in total. Um, I think. Look, in my opinion, my cuts from now, without looking at anything, unfortunately, are Froling, DJ Vasilevich, Pinda, Magne, who some people are pushing for the squad. I just, I just don't see it with the depth they have at the big spots. Um, Furphy and uh, Will McDowell White are my cuts. I've got. My bubble, uh, guys on the bubble, I got Rocco, Golding, Cooks, Daly, Jack White, Nick Kay, Jack McVay. Now, Nick Kay is a controversial one, but I've got him on, on my bubble. They're my bubble guys that, you know, I think I highly doubt they're going to select this this team from the camp. I think most of it's already selected. I would, I would probably think that 9, 10, so probably 10, 11, 12 are up for grabs. I think everything everything else is pretty pretty solidified. I'm going to go with a non-conventional starting five. I haven't really given it that much thought, but I think that I don't think you can play Giddy and Mills together for mass minutes to be successful. I think we saw that at the World Cup. They're both high usage guys of the ball, and I think we played our better basketball when their time was split. Um, and for that reason, I've got Giddy starting at the point. I got Green at the two, Exum at the three, both interchangeable. Exum can actually play some point guard duties. Um, at times, Thibault at the four and Landau at the five. I think it's a, a good athletic lineup. The curveball here is how Thibault shoots it. If he shoots like he shot in the NBA, I think it changes the dynamic of this team. Giddy needs shooting around him. Exum shooting the ball well from three. Green shooting the ball well from three. Um, he's got some shooting in Landau from three if he needs it as an emergency at the five spot. Thibault's the key to this lineup. you got shooting around Giddy. I like it. I then bring Patty in for Giddy at some point. We can move Dante to the one for that stretch if we need to. And then my bench is Patty off the bench in a gunning role. I'd love to see him coming off. He's playing 18 to 20. If he's hot, he's playing 30. If he's not, he's playing closer to 18. Um, it also hides you know, his defensive deficiencies in that starting lineup. Giddy's not a great defender yet. He's got time to get there. Patty's not a great defender. I think having them at the one and the two, you're just starting poor defensively most games. So that's why my other reason why I split that. And I think he's the future of the program, so you got to start him. Dyson as your backup. Patty as your backup. I've got Joe Ingles in there. I think just still provides that veteran leadership, and he's a feet set three ball sniper that you could use. I just don't think he plays playing thirty anymore for the Boomers. Um, I think those days are gone. I just don't think you know the athleticism, the speed. I think he's starting to catch up to the old body, and happens to us all. It happened to old Bogues with the national team when I was coming off the bench for the last stint. I think he's going to be off the bench. He can still provide some vital minutes in games, but I don't think it's going to be at a 30-minute clip. Uh, I've got Reith as my backup five. So that's nine that I think are in. Um, the next three are the interesting ones, Trent, so feel free to chime in. But I've got, as my forward, I probably have Nick Kay getting that that forward spot. Um, that's out of probably Kay, White, Cooks. I'd probably give it to Nick Kay. I think he's been very – his FIBA game has been very serviceable and he's shooting the three ball. The reason why I have him over White and Cooks is probably just because of the three ball consistency. He, he just shoots the shit out of it from three. He's shooting the piss out of it in Japan and he doesn't really need the ball, not that White and Cooks do, but um, I think he just – he's going to steal that spot based on that. 11 – I probably need more shooting, so I'm going with Golding again. Even though the last campaign they brought him and didn't play him, which was kind of, I think you had to play him in stretches. Not great defensively, obviously, getting older, but another sniper that you can put in the corner that no one's going to help off. And 12, I'm taking Rocco. 
taking Rocco with my 12th spot, I think that he needs to be integrated in this squad. Yeah. The th- young kid, that's good. Yeah, seven foot three, elite shot yeah. blocker already. So a guy that you can put in this lineup with a Paddy, with a Giddy, with an Exum that doesn't need the ball is a great role threat. Um, and you can you can penetrate and get that lob up and he's going to finish. He can give you a five, six-minute spurt each half if needed. And, and, and can be serviceable. So I'm not taking him as a young guy that's sitting there to learn. I'm taking him that he could actually help you in a, in, in small patches throughout a game. I think Reese is still going to be the backup big, but Rocco could get in there and cause some trouble. So that leaves Cook's cut, Delhi cut, Jack White cut, and McVeigh. I have McVeigh on the bubble just because I think he's probably, you know, him and Kay are the best shooting four fives we probably have um, on the roster, and McVeigh's had a hell of a run in the NBL but I just don't think he makes a team, but I, I have him in there. You never know. You know, if he said he's really, really shot it well, but I just don't think he'll fit athletically with that group. Um, Dell is the other tough one because I think he's yeah. had a really good NBL season. His aggressiveness to score, his body's in, in crazy shape, but I don't think you can take him over Dyson um, because Dyson's going to be the future as well. And there's also a nod we're talking off air with national teams where 20 percent of your mind maybe 15 percent, has to be towards the future as well and you don't want to take you know i think having having joey and patty on their last legs i think you had another one it's kind of maybe a wasted spot and it's, it's harsh for delhi and he's been great for the boomers but you know with dyson exum green giddy mills it's kind of hard to fit a deli in there as well i think yeah like nick Kay for me is a must I think he proved that at the last World Cup. I just think there were stretches where he was out there for just that bit too long. But, like, if you bring him off the bench in that four spot, he's great in the short role, like, knows how to create out of that. And then, you know, he's always – he's he's kind of like Draymond on in those four and three situations. He always makes the right decision, whether it's a little floater, shot, or the right pass. Like, he's just perfect in that role, I think. So I think Nick's a must – and then I think it's between Goulding and McVeigh. Like, I think McVeigh, you could probably slide up into that 3-2 spot in FIBA because it's it's much more compact. And he showed um, in the NBL level that if you put a guard on him, he'll take advantage of that and can post up, score. So I think he has the ability to shoot the ball just as well as Goulding it's at fair times. Fair point, actually, yeah. And I think you can actually slide him up at times as well. He's just a bit more versatile. And then defensively, I think he just has the edge on Goulding just because of age and like yeah. where they're at at their careers. And then I think the tough one would be Magne or Rocco, in my opinion, because I think they can both bring you the same thing defensively. Like you can bring Magne in, you're not expecting anything from him offensively, but would be great screen setter, rolls hard. And then on the defensive end, an unbelievable rim protector. We saw that in the, in the NBL finals as well. So I think you have a great argument about Rocco getting him involved now. He is the future. He's going to be on multiple Olympic teams, you know, bar health, et cetera. So you get him involved now, get get those reps under him. But I think Magne also has a case that, you know, he can essentially come in and provide the exact same thing Rocco does. But I think you do give the edge to Rocco because you know Rocco is going to be a staple in the program. And, and like you said, there's been moments in Boomer's history where that focus hasn't been there and, you know, the program's paid the price. Like with young guys, yeah. yeah. Yeah, look, I think at a four, four to five-minute burst a game, I think I'd just go with Rocco. I think I think Magne's solid. I think Rocco's probably offensively, I think probably just as good, if not probably can provide more with the lob threat that he is. I mean, Magne's a lob threat, but he's Magne's only 6'8", I think, on a 6'9", yeah, maybe his Timberlands, yeah. yeah. Rocco's legit 7'3", and, and literally, I, I know Magne's a great shot blocker, but but Rocco's blocking shots that he shouldn't block, you know, because he's so long and athletic, right? So that's why, and I, I think, you know, I think he can provide him. I think, you know, Magne's a little bit of an injury history as well, coming out of the, out of that um, that final series was limping around, but I, I just like Rocco, and I think you have to go that younger. I do like, actually, your point on McVeigh Golding. That's a valid point. It's just a, it's just a matter of do you want another guy that can potentially handle the ball a little bit um, go to, but I think McVeigh is decent on an ISO as well with, with with forwards guarding him. So if you're looking just strictly on shooting, McVeigh is definitely a candidate. But it's a, it's a, it's a tough peak and, and someone some you know two or three players are getting screwed. Oh yeah, the Delhi point's great. Like Dyson, the scary thing is Dyson's probably our weakest guard, and that's saying something because yeah. he's like obviously played unbelievably before his injury with the Pelicans defensively this year. So and he's like, shooting the ball well, extremely yeah, well. So ball, like yeah. if Dyson's your worst guard, how can you bring? you know, a Delhi and a Goulding and these other guys because the, the NBA talent now is just there. And especially with these young guys coming through, Green, Daniels, Matisse, like 
you know, it, it, they're, and they're just too versatile defensively. And when we have those weaker players like the Giddies, the Paddies, and these other guys who are going to need help defensively, like you can't turn down Dyson and, and Greeny and these other guys, what they bring on the defensive end. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. And that's that's yeah, the exact reason why I have the lineup with where it is. Um, I think Green and Exum provide three-point shooting and, and they're solid defensively. Fireball's elite defensively and Landau's great defensively. It hides Giddy's deficiencies. Um, and then off the bench, you got to figure out, you know, you bring Paddy into that foul and whatnot and how that all goes. But um, a lot of question marks. It's, at a, it's at a, kind of a little bit of a crossroad with where they go, but it's, you know, two or three players, unfortunately, you know, are, are going to get screwed and be disappointed. But it's, it's, a, it's, it's a good problem as an outsider to have. If you're a fan of the national team where you're like, shit, it's hard to pick the national team. I've been part of national teams where it was like you didn't know who was coming and going and, and it was pretty locked for the most part. You want you want spots being battled for. So it'd be interesting to see how how they go with that. I think the camp's a month before the, the tournament starts, so we'll, we'll find out um, in two or three months' time. Pro, fact or fake news, what do you got? Fact or fake news, this is going to be the end of the fucking show, and I'm going to say fact, and we're not doing a fact and fake news this week. We're an hour and a half in. We'll save it for next time. I'm sure if they're still awake listening to this shit, I'm, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll <laughs> most people are driving. They're not listening to this shit to put them to sleep. They're, they're, they're driving. They're on an airplane. You know, um, I got to take one for the team this week. All right, and I'll just wait for the next time. Fact or fake news? We'll pro have a fact or fake news ready for us next week, bro. <laughs> uh, fact for fact, sure. Fact. All right. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, a bit, little bit of a long one with NBL free agency and whatnot, but hopefully we got through everything. Give it a share. Um, repost our posts so we can get more people listening to the show so we can keep it going for you. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys.